What is surprisingly absent from the discourse is testimony from the human rights investigator designated by the UN to assess said crisis. Alfred de Zayas was the first UN investigator to go to Venezuela in 21 years. He has written 13 reports for the UN Human Rights Council, but his report on Venezuela was largely ignored. I spoke with Alfred to find out why. If you know a humanitarian crisis in Gaza and in Yemen and in Syria and mm. in Sudan and in Somalia, you wouldn't say there is a humanitarian crisis uh, in Venezuela. And at no point when I was walking the streets in Venezuela did I feel uh, threatened or did I see violence or did I uh, consider that this country was undergoing a humanitarian crisis. But uh, I see human rights more and more being instrumentalized to destroy human rights. There is a weaponization of human rights. I see the rule of law being instrumentalized to destroy the rule of law and unfortunately the complicity of the mainstream media. The solution of the problem is much easier than uh, the band-aid of sending uh, some packages of food or of medicine. Uh, the solution is in my report. What I told uh, the uh, Human Rights Council uh, is that the financial blockade has had uh, extremely adverse human rights impacts. Obviously, the origin of the current economic crisis is in the fall, the dramatic fall in the price of oil. But uh, normally, you would be able to fix that. Uh, a country as wealthy as Venezuela should have been able uh, to borrow money uh, on its enormous natural resources and uh, then would have been able to buy and sell like anybody else. But no. Uh, the United States has made sure that uh, because of the threat of enormous penalties to the U.S. Treasury, uh, the banks have been closing the accounts of uh, the Venezuelan government and of the uh, Petroleos of Venezuela. Already in July uh, 2017, uh, Citibank unexpectedly decided without prior notice and arbitrarily to close the bank accounts of the Central Bank of Venezuela and the Bank of Venezuela in November 2017. Uh, again, uh, Citibank uh, blocked uh, the uh, transfer uh, for a shipment of more than 300,000 doses uh, of insulin. In November 2017, the company Euroclear retained $1.65 billion that the Venezuelan government had paid for the purpose uh, for the purchase of food and medicine. Uh, CITCO, the uh, uh, Venezuelan state oil company based in the U.S., has not been able to transfer its profits outside the United States of America. It needs that money to buy mm -hmm. food and medicine. And it is in the neighborhood, I think, by now of nine or uh, $10 billion uh, dollars that have been withheld. There again, Wells Fargo Bank uh, withheld and canceled payment of 7500000 made by Brazil to Venezuela uh, for the sale of electricity. In May 2018, the Venezuelan Minister of People's Power uh, informed that a financial transaction amounting to $7 million for the purchase of dialysis supplies for patients, including children and adolescents, uh, requiring such treatment had been blocked. So uh, you see here uh, the immorality of it, but not only the immorality of it, uh, there is personal criminal liability uh, for the impact of these sanctions. I mean, I am certain that the increase in uh, child mortality, the increase uh, in maternal mortality, the increased deaths for uh, lack of 
insulin or lack of uh, antiretroviral drugs uh, is a direct result of this blockage so that uh, Venezuela has not been able to uh, purchase what its people uh, deserve. It's not like the government doesn't want to distribute is that the government is being, through an external economic war, is being asphyxiated. And that was the name of the game. What the United States intended to do was to create a situation whereby the people or the military uh, would topple the government and then uh, the 1% uh, could again come in and could again control the wealth uh, of Venezuela. Venezuela had succeeded in uh, bringing uh, millions and millions of Venezuelans out of extreme poverty. Nobody cared in the 1980s and 90s that there were millions of Venezuelans dying of hunger and malnutrition. No one cared. It, it, it was a government that was palatable to Washington and a government that was a right-wing government. The moment that a left-wing government came in power, uh, priority number one in Washington was to topple it. And now you have the Bank of England seizing the gold, right, from Maduro, over a billion dollars worth, and threatening to give it to Juan Guaido. That's yet another violation of international law. But uh, try to bring the United States before the International Criminal Court or before the International Court of Justice. Uh, what I think is important now would be for the General Assembly to adopt a resolution condemning the sanctions and asking that the sanctions be lifted because sanctions kill. I would also like to see right. the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court investigate to what extent uh, the deaths already occurred in connection uh, with the sanctions amount to a violation of Article 7 of the Statute of Rome. Article 7 defines crimes against humanity. Now, when you deliberately impose sanctions and financial blockades and an economic war that as asphyxiates a country's economy and thereby make it very difficult for that country to provide the necessary food and medicines to its population, and as a consequence, thousands of people die, you have a case of crime against humanity. But the narrative in the mainstream press completely ignores it. When they refer to a humanitarian crisis, they put the entire fault on the government and uh, they say, well, socialism is a proven failure. Socialism will never work. Therefore, you have to have regime change. Jeffrey Sachs is with us here in New York, leading economist and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. He's recently authored, co-authored a report for the Center for Economic and Policy Research, headlined, Economic Sanctions as Collective Punishment, the Case of Venezuela. So much is being used against the presidency of uh, Maduro, uh, saying he's brought the country to an economic standstill. You make a different case, Jeffrey Sachs. Well, it's, it's not an economic standstill. It's a complete economic collapse, a catastrophe in Venezuela. There was a crisis, uh, for sure, uh, before uh, Trump came to office. But the idea of the Trump administration from the start has been to overthrow Maduro. That's not a hypothesis. So Trump was very explicit in discussions with presidents of Latin America, where he asked them, why shouldn't the U.S. just invade? He said that already in 2017. So the idea of the Trump administration has been to overthrow Maduro from the start. Well, the uh, Latin leaders said, no, no, that's not a good idea. We, we don't want uh, military action. So the U.S. government has been trying to strangle the Venezuelan economy. It started with sanctions uh, in 2017 that prevented, essentially, the country from accessing international capital markets and the oil company from 
uh, restructuring its loans. That put Venezuela into a hyperinflation. That was the utter collapse. Uh, oil earnings plummeted. The earnings that are used to buy food and medicine collapsed. Uh, that's when the social humanitarian crisis uh, went spiraling out of control. And then in this year, is with this uh, idea, very naive, very uh, stupid in my view, uh, that there would be this self-proclaimed president, which was all choreographed with the United States very, very closely, uh, a, another round of even tighter sanctions, essentially uh, confiscating the earnings and the assets of the Venezuelan government took place. Now Venezuela is in complete, utter catastrophe. A lot of it brought on by the United States deliberately, creating massive, massive suffering. We know there's hunger. We know there's an incredible shortage of uh, medical supplies. Uh, we can only imagine, because uh, we won't know really until the dust settles and careful studies are done, how much excess mortality there is. But surely in, in a context like this, this is a catastrophe largely created by the U.S. because as was said earlier, this is an all-or-nothing strategy. What the U.S., what Trump just doesn't understand and, and what Bolton, of all, uh, of course, uh, never agrees to is the idea of negotiations. This is an attempt at an overthrow. It's very crude. It's not working. And uh, it's very cruel because it's uh, punishing 30 million people. You know, for the past year or two or more, there's been this narrative in the media that all of this is directed to pressure the Maduro uh, government, the Venezuelan government, to do certain things. Now, the latest, it's been to hold new elections. Uh, previously, it was other demands. But this was never true. The purpose has always been to increase the suffering in Venezuela to the point where uh, the government's popularity falls uh, so much that the military intervenes or somehow uh, through uh, violence uh, the government is overthrown. That's the, uh, that's the actual strategy and it's of course become much uh, clearer now. Tell us about the broader uh, consequences uh, these financial sanctions of the Trump administration have so far had on the Venezuelan economy. Yes, well, most of the impact hasn't really been reported here because I think the, the basic theme in the media is that everything that's gone wrong in Venezuela is a fault of the government. Of course, the government says there's an economic war and they don't want to acknowledge that. So you don't even see reporting. So, for example, you had a collapse of oil production uh, following the sanctions of August 2017. And you can see this on the graph. Uh, this graph is from Francisco Rodriguez of Torino Capital, and he published this. Uh, he actually published it with the Washington office on Latin America. And uh, Torino Capital, uh, Francisco himself is probably the leading uh, expert and authority on the Venezuelan economy anywhere. And so, and there's no debate about the data. And you can see what happens uh, both, uh, this is a graph of oil production from, in Venezuela from 2013 to 2018. And for a while, of course, the both graphs are flat. The orange one is uh, Colombia and the blue one is uh, Venezuela. And so you can compare the two, and you can see they both decline uh, at the same time and at roughly the same rate in response to the drop in oil prices. And then the Colombian oil production levels out, whereas after August, 7, uh, August 2017, Venezuela's production just falls through the floor. And that's a result of the sanctions. And the interesting thing is that even though this was published and it's readily available and there's absolutely no one who challenges it, 
none of the media, as far as I can tell, even reported this impact of the sanctions that it uh, devastated Venezuela's oil production. And it's kind of strange because, you know, most of these reporters are and editors are in favor of the sanctions. And you would think they would at least want to report uh, what the sanctions did. But they don't, and there's an almost military uh, discipline about it. that Nobody will uh, talk about it. And, of course, they don't talk about uh, the other impacts of the sanctions, that this impact, but also the other impacts of the sanctions, do actually kill people uh, by depriving them of access to medicines. That is, the uh, loss of oil production means less uh, dollars for the country and for the government, which means less medicines. Uh, life-saving medicines available. And then, of course, as it destroys the economy, and also because there are many other impacts as well that lead to a loss of life. So, uh, for example, even though the sanctions don't say that uh, financial institutions can't give credit uh, for medicines or food, that ends up being the case. They end up not giving this credit because they're being conservative. They don't want to run into a legal problem with the U.S. government or get fined, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars as other governments have been for violating various sanctions that the United States has put on, on, on countries like Cuba or Iran or North Korea. So this is really the impact. Uh, the sanctions have an enormous impact on the economy. And the other impact that they have, of course, is they make it nearly impossible for, and maybe even impossible for, the economy to recover from the devastating hyperinflation and depression that they have now. As I mentioned in the introduction, the Trump administration is once again actively considering oil sanctions against Venezuela. If that were to happen, it would reduce Venezuela's export income by approximately 50 percent. What effect would that have on the country if it were to happen? Yeah, that would, that would be, make everything much worse. I mean, it's already quite bad. They're in a serious uh, depression and they have extreme hyperinflation probably over a million percent by now, and it's continuing. And the thing about the hyperinflation is that if it weren't for the sanctions, it wouldn't be that difficult to get rid of the hyperinflation. When it gets to the range uh, that it's in, uh, hyperinflation, and in, in, in the range that it's in in, in Venezuela, uh, there are ways to get rid of it rather quickly. So, for example, in Bolivia, in 1985, they had hyperinflation that was comparable to this, and they got rid of it in 10 days. And so the the way in which they get rid of it is, uh, in most cases, uh, is called exchange rate-based uh, stabilization. In cases of exchange rate-based stabilization, the economy grows, uh, it actually re grows as you get rid of the hyperinflation. That is, they don't have to go through any kind of austerity uh, to get rid of this uh, kind of inflation. I mean, they've already done that adjustment. The imports of Venezuela have shrunk by more than 80 percent in the last uh, six years. And, you know, compare, uh, make a comparison in Greece, six years of depression, they reduced imports by 36 percent. So they've adjusted, they've done all the hard uh, parts in terms of the real economy, and they would actually recover. And I think that is the other thing that nobody uh, reports, uh, but any economist could tell you about this situation. The sanctions make it pretty much impossible for the government to implement the probably the easiest way out of the economic crisis. Yeah, I think that's a very important point and that, of course, uh, imposing oil sanctions will only make the situation even worse and make it impossible to, to apply those measures that you're talking about. But why do you think the Trump administration, specifically Vice President Mike Pence, who's taking the uh, point role on this, uh, is why is the Trump administration considering uh, to making this move now to impose further sanctions and who do you think would benefit? I mean, what's behind this? Well, it's a coordinated effort. They have these right-wing governments in Argentina and Brazil and other countries. Uh, and so 
they all obviously made a decision when, together with uh, the part of the opposition in Venezuela that's also trying to overthrow the government. And, and that's what all this is. I mean, it's not a, you know, something that's to pressure the government to do something. There's nothing the government could do uh, except uh, collapse or resign uh, to get rid of these uh, sanctions. And it's not even clear they'd get rid of it, you know, if Maduro resigned, for example. I mean, the U.S. wants its people in power. They're not really interested in elections or any kind of peaceful or negotiated uh, transition. They just want to get their people in there. And I think they probably picked uh, this time because January 10th, was the inauguration of uh, Maduro. And so this was a date that they could use for their media campaign. On Saturday, self-proclaimed interim president Juan Guaido is promising to de deliver tens of millions of dollars in international aid, mainly from the US, Canada, Colombia, and Brazil, into Venezuela with the help of opposition supporters. President Nicolas Maduro has denounced the effort, saying it is a pretext for military action. International aid groups such as the Red Cross and the UN have declined to participate, saying that the aid has been politicized and thus does not meet their criteria for involvement. Meanwhile, U.S.-imposed sanctions continue to wreak havoc on Venezuela's economy. Oil companies report that U.S. Gulf Coast refineries are scrambling to find new supply sources for the heavy crude they once received from Venezuela. Venezuela itself says that it can sell its oil to India and China instead of the U.S., but it's not clear yet how the payments will be processed. Also, a battle has, has erupted over who controls CITGO when the U.S. said it would impose a new board of directors that uh, interim president Juan Guaido has named. Joining me now to discuss the effects of the sanctions and some of the most recent developments in Venezuela is Mark Weisbrot. Mark is co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Thanks for joining us today, Mark. Thanks for inviting me, Gregory. So let's start with the sanctions. We've discussed these before, uh, here before on several occasions, but it's increasingly becoming clear that the last round of sanctions that were imposed on January 28th, only five days after opposition leader Juan Guaido swore himself into office, are more draconian than most sanctions the U.S. has imposed. How would you compare these sanctions to, uh, let's say, the ones that have been imposed on Iraq, and just to how much damage are they causing at the moment? Well, the Iraq sanctions during the 90s were quite damaging. The UN estimates of, and other estimates of the number of children who died as a result of those sanctions is in the hundreds of thousands during the 90s. And, and yet the, these are even worse because the trade embargo, first you have to understand that when they recognize Guaido as president, that created a trade embargo because Venezuela sells its oil for dollars uh, around the world. And three quarters of its export markets consist of the United States and the countries that have joined the Trump regime change effort and recognized the Guaido government. And so that money, that foreign exchange, the source of almost all the foreign exchange for the whole economy of Venezuela, not just the government, but the whole economy, that's gone uh, with this. So in the in the and they made some they carved out some exceptions for their oil companies, but those are temporary and the whole thing is still a sweeping a trade embargo. And so that's quite devastating. Now they did this to Iraq, but they actually had a, an oil for food program that allowed them to export uh, a fair amount of oil. So. This is really a devastating set of sanctions that they've just imposed. But even before that, since August of 2017, that executive order by Trump created a financial embargo. And that was devastating. That, uh, and I think we discussed this before, you know, that cut hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil out of production and cost them at least uh, six billion dollars in terms of lost oil production. And again, if you compare that to their total goods imports for 2018, which are 11 billion, that's huge. Or you compare it to the two billion dollars that they used to spend on medicine. So this is really a devastating set of sanctions going back uh, quite a while. 
And if you want to go back further to when Obama issued the executive order in March of 2015, those sanctions also damage the economy because even though they're say those sanctions are targeted on individuals, when they target government officials who have to handle financial transactions around the world, then uh, that causes enormous problems as well. And the banks and financial institutions uh, take their cue from that and they stop uh, lending. And that, that really started uh, a couple of years before the August of 2017 uh, Trump sanctions. Hmm. Now, legally, the only way the U.S. can impose sanctions is by naming Venezuela an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States. No one ever seems to mention this. Uh, is it perhaps because this is actually an irrelevant, irrelevant clause in U.S. law? Yes, that's very important. Not only do they say in every executive order since March of 2015 that Venezuela poses an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States, but they also declare a national emergency for the United States caused by Venezuela. So it's exactly what Trump did with the wall. There will be um, an effort to bring uh, humanitarian aid into Venezuela that the opposition is organizing with the help of the United States and the go governments of Colombia and Brazil. Uh, many groups such as the Inter-American Dialogue, a think tank based in Washington DC, are calling on Maduro to accept this aid, but do not want to say a word about the effects of the sanctions. Now, just this raises the question, just how do the sanctions compare to the aid that is being offered? Yeah, the aid is tiny compared to what the sanctions, the billions of dollars that are, are lost to the economy. And that's what makes the whole thing so farcical. Imagine, here is this huge power and it's doing everything it can to deprive people of food and medicine. It's really, that's what they're doing. And spare parts and everything that the economy needs and wiping out the income of millions of people. And doing this very as forcefully as it can really do, as I said, the only exception they carved out from the latest uh, set of sanctions is to protect is is to protect the profits of their some of their own oil industries. But this is really a, a massive effort to increase the suffering there, so that people will rebel or the army will rebel. They've said that uh, openly. And at the same time, then they say, as a PR stunt, we're going to uh, try and get this aid across the board. And that's why the international organizations that really care about humanitarian aid, like the International Red Cross or the United Nations, they want nothing to do with this uh, so-called relief effort. But I have to say, you know, if you weren't following this very, very closely, uh, and you are just watching the television news or any, you know, most of the news that people get here, it, their whole uh, PR stunt appears to, to be pretty solid. It looks like uh, they're the actually uh, trying to help and this uh, evil person that they've demonized is trying to prevent uh, people from getting their beneficent aid. Right.